Before we begin today's episode of the Jewish History Podcast, I want to make an announcement to the audience, to my dear listeners and friends. Our organization, Torch, uh, we have rabbis who work out of Houston, Texas, and we teach Torah in all kinds of interesting, innovative ways. We also have students that we send to Israel as a very robust program and organization that we run. And our philosophy is that we want to spread Torah, we want to reach out to Jews all over the world the entire year. And because we're a nonprofit, we have no other forms of revenue. There's no restaurant in the back that we use to make money. And the only way that we are supported is via the generosity of our friends and our donors and our supporters and our students. And we developed a philosophy to try to compress as much as we can of our fundraising efforts into one day a year so that 364 days a year we can focus on what our mission is to connect Jews and Judaism. Today, the day that this episode is being launched, is being uploaded, this is the day that we're going to fundraise. And the website is givetorch.com. It's an entirely online program. And what's nice about this is that every single donation that is made, regardless of its sum, is going to be quadrupled. So if you listen and enjoy to the Jewish History Podcast or maybe the Parsha Podcast, all the variety of other podcasts that I do, please consider making a donation today towards the campaign. You could pause the episode, go online, I'll take a minute, make a donation, help support the good work of Torch. And you'll notice on the website that there's going to be also a special link to support the Jewish History Podcast, and I'm going to put that in the description of the episode. Thank you so much for your listenership. Thank you for supporting Torch and myself throughout the years. I look forward to keeping the flame of torch burning brightly throughout the year 2019. Thanks again for listening. The final judge to lead the people in the book of Judges was the most unique one of them all, a mighty warrior who single-handedly faced a formidable enemy, a controversial man who had a miraculous beginning and a tragic end And of course, we're talking about Samson the Mighty. His story is covered in chapters 13 through 17 of the book, and the book of Judges ends uh, with two unimaginably horrific episodes that transpire during the era of the judges as a function of the nature of leadership. As you mentioned in previous episodes, the Jewish people, uh, over the course of this 400-year period of the judges, they did not have a king to ensure that sacrilegious movements are quashed and to ensure that internal peace is maintained. And two prominent times throughout the era of the judges, things got a little bit out of hand with devastating results. So these three storylines, the storyline of Samson and the two tragedies that happened at the end of the book are the subject of the third and final episode of the era of judges. So chapter 13 begins, the children of Israel again did what was evil in the eyes of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them in the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. As we have seen, there's a pattern that plays itself out again and again in the book of Judges. When the nation becomes spiritually decadent, they are immediately subject to harsh foreign oppression. And as has happened throughout the book, when they are oppressed, a judge arises to help save the nation and to save the nation this time from the Philistines, a very different kind of Jewish leader is introduced and his story actually begins before conception. So verse 2 reads, there was a certain man from Sora, from the tribe of Dan, his name was Manoah and his wife was barren, she bore him no children. And an angel of God appeared to the woman and said to her, You are barren and have bore no children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Like a lot of the very famous individuals throughout Jewish history that were born after years of infertility, like Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Samuel. Samson, too, is going to be born after many years of his parents suffering from infertility. But beyond the miraculous and prophetic nature of his conception, his parents were given a very interesting, a very unusual set of restrictions of how to treat him, of how to raise him before he was born. So the angel tells 
Samson's mother. Now be careful not to drink wine or any other intoxicant, not to eat anything unkosher, for you're going to conceive and bear a son, and once he's born, let no razor touch his head, for the boy is going to be a nazir. To God from the womb, he shall deliver Israel from the Philistines. Samson's mother is told before he's even conceived that he's going to be a nazir, meaning that he's going to have very rigid restrictions, namely not to drink wine or any other grape products, nor to have his hair cut, and those restrictions are going to accompany him throughout his entire life. That was the first visitation that she had. And then a second visitation happened. The angel, again, the angel's masquerading as a man. He reappears, this time not just to Samson's mother, but to his father, Manoah, too. And in stunningly dramatic fashion, he confirms the prophecy. Son shall be a nazir from the womb. He may never drink wine nor cut his hair. Now, there is a portion of the Torah dedicated to the Nazir, and there is a third restriction that the Nazir is prohibited from doing something, and that is from coming into contact with dead people. So, if someone becomes a voluntary Nazir, they have three restrictions, no grape or grape products, no haircuts, and no coming into contact with that. You can't go to a cemetery. You can't touch a dead body. Samson is a unique kind of Nazir because A, he didn't choose it. It was imposed upon him. B, it was from day one and forever. And C, because he is not going to have that same restriction of coming into contact with dead people, which anyhow would prove impossible given the career path that Samson is going to undertake with respect to the Philistines. So the angel comes, gives them this wonderful news, and they offer a sacrifice on a private altar. And as they're burning the sacrifice, the angel, again, he's masquerading as a person, he climbs into the fire and together with the flames ascends to heaven. And Manoah and his wife, they see that, and now they know for sure this is not a regular human, this is an angel. And they fall on their faces. They're sure they're about to die. And Manoah says to his wife, we read in verse 22, we shall surely die for we have seen a divine being. But his wife reassures him, don't worry. Had the Lord meant to take our lives, he wouldn't have accepted our sacrifice. And don't worry, he wouldn't have made this announcement to us. We're going to make it through this vision. Indeed, they survived and Samson is born. And he grew up, and we're told that he's blessed by God. He was endowed with superhuman strength, and the Spirit of God throbbed within him. And this is important to stress. There's a misconception about Samson that he's some sort of wild guy with long hair, very violent and aggressive. But we see right away from the very beginning that everything that he did was a function of the fact that the Spirit of God was alive and stirring within him. Now, it is interesting that he had to be a Nazir. And this is kind of a strange requirement. Uh, Why was it important that Samson be a Nazir, refrain from wine and from cutting his hair? And the answer is that Samson is destined to be unlike all the other judges. His role was to be a warrior But not just a warrior that rallies an army. He was going to fight against the Philistines single-handedly. And moreover, he's not going to be officially sanctioned by the Jews. He's not going to be viewed as the titular leader of the Jews. And therefore, when Samson goes rogue and attacks the Philistines, the Philistines are not going to have any blowback attack the Jews because they view him as somewhat of an outsider. He's going to infiltrate the heart of the enemy. He's going to marry Philistine women. He's going to fight them and combat them from within. Because his mission would entail that he hobnobs, that he fraternizes with all kinds of Philistine women, he was required to become a Nazir, to refrain from wine, not be allowed to drink, not to get drunk, and hopefully that would help inoculate him from sin when he's surrounded by all these bad influences. 
So that's Samson. We meet him and we're introduced to his character. And the first move that he makes in chapter 14 of the book of Judges is that he goes to seek out a Philistine wife. Samson went down to Timnah. And while in Timnah, he noticed a girl amongst the Philistine women. And he returns to his parents and he tells his father and mother, I noticed one of the Philistine women in Timnah, please get her for me as a wife. And his parents, they're puzzled with this request. Are there no Jewish women for you to marry? And they, of course, didn't realize this is all part of his plan to infiltrate at the heart of the enemy and to go attack them in that fashion and to shield his Jewish brethren from any blowback. So Samson and his parents, they go back to Timnah to go meet this Philistine woman. And along the way, there's a very unusual encounter that Samson has with a ferocious lion. And this episode, I think, does serve as a fitting introduction to Samson's superhuman strength. So they're traveling down to Timnah to meet this Philistine woman, and they come across a vineyard. And a vineyard's full of grapes. And the law is that Samson, he's a Nazar, he can't walk through the vineyard because that's getting a little bit too close to the grapes that are forbidden. So his parents take the direct route through the vineyard, and he takes the circuitous route around the vineyard by himself. And there, when he's alone, we read in chapter 14, verse 5, And behold, a young lion was roaring towards him. And in the sign of what was yet to come, Samson calmly grabs the lion, tears him apart with ease, and leaves the carcass on the ground and continues along the way as if nothing had happened. In fact, when he reunites with his parents, he doesn't even tell them about what had happened. For him, ripping apart a lion with his own hands was like, for us, swatting a fly. It's totally expected. It was totally unremarkable. And he didn't feel like he had to share it with his parents. It was just all in a day's work. They continue along the way. They get to Timnah. They meet this Philistine woman. She's pleasing in Samson's eyes. And a wedding date is set. This is a theme that we see with Samson. We're told several times through the story that the Philistine women were pleasing in his eyes. He lusted after them a little bit too much with his eyes. And that will come back to bite him later on in the story. Now, it's important to stress that although Samson is marrying these Philistine women, he did it with the expressed goal of using that union as a means to go attack the Philistines and to deflect any collateral damage from the Jews. And also, in addition, it's quite clear from the sources that he would first convert the women so they were technically Jewish before he married them. He didn't go intermarry uh, outside of the tribe. So the wedding date has been set, and sometime later, Samson and his parents, they're going back to Timnah for the wedding. And again, they're traveling on the path and they get to that same vineyard. Again, the parents take the direct route, and he goes around, and he wants to check up on that carcass of the lion. And he sees the lion's corpse It's teeming with bees, and it's bursting with honey. He scoops some of it out with his hands, and he's eating it along the way. And he reunites with his parents, and he gives them some of the honey as well. And that little story is going to play a part in the actual wedding festivities. At the wedding, so this is a nice Jewish boy, Samson, with his parents, and he's marrying this unnamed Philistine girl, And there's all kinds of Philistine guests. And at the wedding, Samson poses a riddle to the 30 Philistine guests that were assembled. And he offers them the following wager. I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to give you a riddle. And you have seven days to give me an answer. Seven days of celebration. Seven days for you to answer the riddle. If you get the right answer... I will give each one of you a set of clothing 
and a linen tunic. So I'll give 30 prizes to you, get Philistine guests. But if you can't get the answer within seven days, then y'all give me 30 sets of garments and 30 sheets of linen. And they accept the deal. And we have game on. There's a wager. And he responds with the following indecipherable riddle. He tells him, from the eater came forth food. Out of the strong came something sweet. That's the riddle. What's the message? So we know the answer because we read about the story that happened with the lion. But to them, they're totally puzzled. So for three days, they're unsuccessfully brainstorming to try to find an answer. And after fruitless efforts, the Philistine guests resorted to unconventional and maybe, dare we say, unethical ways to get the answer. They go to Samson's new wife and they make her an offer she couldn't refuse. They said, entice your husband to get the answer. Otherwise, we'll burn you and your father's household down to the ground. So left with no choice, Samson's wife starts harassing him. She starts nagging him. She starts crying. You hate me. You don't love me, she tells him. You ask my countrymen a riddle and you don't give me the answer. So he tells her, listen, I I didn't even tell my own parents the answer. How could I tell you? But she doesn't stop. Her nagging is incessant. And finally, Samson reveals to her the answer. And she promptly goes, and shares the answer with the 30 guests. It's quite clear, I would say, from the first week of marriage that this is not going to last very long. Anyhow, it's day seven, and the week of celebrations are nearing their end, and the deadline for the wager is swiftly approaching. And then at the final moments, the guests reveal the correct and illegitimately gotten answer to the riddle, and they tell Samson, What is sweeter than honey and what is stronger than a lion? And this treachery where Samson's wife betrayed him, his Philistine wife betrayed him, he used this as a pretext for his first attack against the Philistines. And as we'll see, his attacks are going to progressively escalate. So he travels to Ashkelon, he finds 30 Philistine men, He attacks them. He kills them. He confiscates their garments. He goes back and gives those 30 guests, those 30 people that he had the wager, he gives them those garments and he pays off his wager. But he's so angry at his wife for revealing his secret. So he leaves her. He goes home. She leaves him. She goes to her house and she marries someone else despite the fact that she was still married to Samson. Like we said, not exactly a union built to last. Now, Samson's wife's infidelity is going to be the pretext for his next attack against the Philistines. This attack, exponentially bolder and more audacious and specifically tailored and targeted to inflict maximum damage. Sometime later, Samson reaches out to his estranged wife and he wants to reconcile. And he goes to her father's home and he speaks to her, her father, his father-in-law. And she, he tells him, I'm sorry, I got bad news for you, but your wife, she's now living with some other man and she's still technically married to Samson. But you know what? I have a younger and way better daughter. Why don't you marry her? So now Samson has evidence of the guilt of the Philistines. There's brazen adultery being undertaken over here. No one's protesting. Clearly, the people are guilty and they are liable. So Samson declares, now the Philistines have no claim against me for the harm that I'm about to inflict upon them. I'm truly blameless for the destruction that I'm about to wreak upon the Philistines. Samson traps 300 foxes and he takes 150 torches And he ties a flaming torch with the tails of two foxes and he releases them amongst the grain fields of the Philistines smack in the middle 
of the harvest season. So we know in Israel, the end of the summer, it's, it's a very dry time because it doesn't rain in the summer. So it's very dry and the grain is very hot and imminently flammable. And now you have these foxes tied together, freaking out because it's fire, running around and lighting the entire harvest into smoldering ash. And, of course, Samson has what to rely upon. After all, they were guilty. His wife, you know, she acted unfaithfully and no one stopped it. Then he has, he has, he has an excuse. So the Philistines wake up and everything's destroyed and devastated. They, they try to investigate. Who, well, who did this? So they said, well, it was Samson, the son, son-in-law of this guy from Timnah. And why he did it? Because this man took Samson's wife and gave her to someone else. So what do the Philistines do? They went to Samson's wife and to his father-in-law and they destroyed them in a fire. So Samson had some degree of uh, some alibi, something to explain, to rationalize, to justify his behavior. They didn't come after him. They went after the guilty parties. But Samson now said, well, they just killed my wife. So again, he's using the circumstances as a pretext for his next attack. And he goes and he strikes down an untold number of Philistine cavalry and infantry. So again, he's attacking them again and again. And after he destroyed them all, he runs and he escapes into a cave. And while hiding in the cave, the Philistines start mobilizing for war. And this time, they're not willing to say, oh, Samson was justified. And they're not willing to say, oh, Samson is a rogue. They encamp near Judah and they say, listen, either you hand over Samson or we're going to attack you. And the people of Judah, they come to Samson, they come to his cave and they say, listen, we got to hand you over to the Philistines. We have no choice. And Samson says, okay, no, no problem. If you can hand me over. I'm willing to be restrained by your ropes just as long as you guys don't attack me. And they agreed. The Jews are not going to attack him. They're just going to hand them over to the Philistines. Let the Philistines do what they want with him. No problem. So Samson goes out of the cave and they tie him up with fresh ropes really nice and tight. And ostensibly, he's contained by his bonds and they lead him to the Philistines. And of course, it doesn't work out as planned. What followed was an unprecedented and miraculous superhero-like trouncing. This is from chapter 15, verse 14. When he reached Lachi, the Philistines came shouting to meet him. Thereupon, the spirit of the Lord gripped him, which by the way, happened, is described before every one of his attacks, the spirit of the Lord gripped him. And the ropes on his arms became like flax that catches fire. The bonds melted off his hands. He found a fresh jawbone of a donkey. He picked it up and with it, he killed a thousand Philistine men. Then Samson said, with the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of a donkey, I have slain a thousand men. He finishes speaking. He takes the jawbone. He tosses it away. And the scripture interjects, hence that place is called Ramat Lechi, meaning jawbone hill. Such a miraculous event. He bursts out of his binds, attacks them with, with a, essentially it's a bone, as a bone of, bone of a donkey, doesn't matter. He's a superhero and he attacks with ferocity and he destroys his enemy. What a miraculous thrashing. Right after the battle, Samson is stricken with a deadly bout of thirst. He's about to die and he calls out to God, you granted me a great victory, but now I'm going to die of thirst and fall into the hands of the uncircumcised. And one final miracle occurred. That same jawbone opened and water began gushing out of it and Samson was revived. After this miracle, a tenuous peace ensued. Scripture tells us that Samson judged the people for 20 years, but the Philistines were not quite banished. Their grip maybe was loosened but their control over the land did not cease. Now, it is noteworthy that all the other judges were given the duration of their judgeship at the end of their tenure. Whereas by Samson, right smack in the middle of his career, we're told that he judged for 20 years. And the reason for this is, is that 
Samson kind of had a an arc. He had this peak. He had this apex at this miracle with the jawbone. But then sadly, he had a decline and ultimately it culminated in his eventual downfall. And that begins in chapter 16. Chapter 16 tells us of Samson's escapades, if you will, in the city of Gaza. It seems if you read this simple translation of scripture, it seems like he went to patronize a woman of ill repute. So what did he go there for? It's a discussion amongst the commentaries. What exactly was happening there? Was he com- coming to stir up trouble or was he coming to sin? But it's interesting. He goes to Gaza at the time a great fortified city, and like today, not exactly the safest neighborhood for a nice Jewish boy. But Samson, Samson is no ordinary Jewish boy. He's a warrior, the likes of which the world has never seen. He's fearless, and he specifically walked into the lion's den to terrify them with what he's about to do on their home turf. So the Gazans find out Guess who's in town? Samson is hiding out someplace in town. So they immediately begin patrolling the cities. We're going to find our nemesis and we're finally going to kill him. And we know he's in the city. So they go to the city gates and they bolted the enormously heavy city gates shot so no one could leave. Now Samson is napping and he wakes up at midnight and he starts walking out of town and he gets to the door. But alas... The city gates are locked. Now, Samson could have easily just burst through the doors and escaped. But shall we say he had more ambitious plans? He takes the doors and the crossbar and the doorposts. He rips them off and puts them on his shoulders and starts marching out of town with them and travels a great distance and deposits the entire infrastructure that kept the gates of Gaza, he just deposits them on a hilltop somewhere in the distance. And we can only imagine the shock and the fear of the Gazans when they discover the manner in which their nemesis snuck out of the city. But eventually the Philistines got to Samson when he married yet another Philistine woman, this time the treacherous Delilah. The Philistine chieftains came to her and they said, you know, entice him. Find out why he's so – we cannot – we can't overcome him. What's his kryptonite? What what can we do to overcome him, to overpower him, to even tie him down so we can attack him, so we can torment him, so we can avenge all the things that he did to us? And they said, listen, if you give the secret of Samson's strength to us, we'll give you 1,100 shekels of silver, an astronomic figure. So she began pestering Samson to discover the source of his strength. So he begins by giving her these fake answers. He says, well, if you tie me up with seven wet twines, well, then I become like an ordinary man. So they do it. He's sleeping. They tie him up. And they say, oh, the Philistines are coming. And he snaps out of his bonds like no big deal. And uh, the enemies have no control over him. So then he tells her, okay, you know what? If there's seven new ropes and you wrap those seven new ropes, that will work. Of course, it doesn't work. He says, well, if you braid my hair, if you weave it together, that will stop me. And of course, every time the Philistines pounced, his strength was undiminished and they couldn't get anywhere near him. And finally, after continuous, unrelenting nagging, he told her the truth. His strength lies in his pre-birth Nazarite vow, if they were to shave his hair, then he would truly be like an ordinary man. So he was lulled into a sleep and his hair was surreptitiously cut. This time, his superhuman strength was truly sapped. And when the Philistine attacked, he was a sitting duck. He was unable to defend himself and he was subdued. Right away, the Philistines seized him. They gouged out his eyes. They brought him down to Gaza. They shackled him with copper chains. And they made him a slave in a mill grinding wheat, a shameful, demeaning task. They put him in prison doing that. And our sages tell us that Samson followed his eyes. 
It's either a reference to the fact that he was infatuated by beautiful but dangerous and harmful Philistine women or by the fact that he relied on his own fortitude to resist sin. Regardless, it was appropriate, say our sages, that his punishment was that his eyes were gouged out because he followed his eyes. He's weakened. He's humiliated. He's been blinded. He's been beaten up. But slowly, his hair begins to grow back. And this is a sign that God is going to be arming him with strength for one last, final, heroic salvo against the Philistines. His opportunity was about to come. The chieftains of the Philistines, they gathered to celebrate the capture of their foe. They're offering sacrifices to their pagan god. They're making this boisterous party. And in the middle of the party, they demand, let's see our prisoner. Let's mock him. So they summon Samson. He's being held by a boy, guided. He's blind after all. And they say, okay, Samson, perform before the jeering crowds. And they take him and they guide him in this huge building Buildings packed with people. All the important honchos of the Philistines are there. There's even 3,000 spectators on the roof. Everyone's there to mock him, to deride him, to jeer at him. And he's going to perform for them. And they're going to have a good laugh at his expense. And Samson asked the boy, do me a favor, navigate me to the pillars that are upholding the building so I could steady myself. And when he gets there and his hands touch the pillars, he cries out to God. God, Zechrenina, remember me. Give me strength just one more time. Let me get some revenge of the Philistines for what they did to me. Maybe it's only the revenge for one of my eyes. Let me get revenge. And he grabs the two pillars with his hands, one on each right, one on the right, one on the left, and he screams out, Tamut Nafshim him. let me die with the Philistines. He pulls with all his strength and the pillars buckled, and the building collapsed on everyone inside, killing Samson along with all the Philistine leaders. And Scripture, in its epilogue of the story, attests that the death toll from this final miracle eclipsed all the other enemy kills of Samson's career. Samson's body is collected by his family members. He's buried in the ancestral burial plot next to his father, Manoah. And scripture tells us that the impact of Samson's eradication of the Philistine chieftains, all the important people are dead, and that was felt not just by his death, but long afterwards. The Philistines are bereft of leaders, and they did not rise up against the Jews for 20 years after Samson's death. Now, Samson is going to be the last judge to act as a military leader. He's also the last judge that we meet in the book of Judges. The final two judges before the appointment of Saul as the first king of Israel are going to be number one, Eli, Eli, Hakoin, Eli, the, pre- the priest. He's already active in the tabernacle in Shiloh during Samson's lifetime. And Samson, the prophet, both of those are not military leaders. They're going to be strictly religious leaders. The book of Judges ends with two tragic episodes, the image of Micah, the Pesalmicha, and the concubine of Giva. Now, it's important to note, just chronologically speaking, both of these events happened towards the beginning of the era of the Judges, but they're only recounted in the book at the very end. Now, during this nearly 400-year period of history, the nation did not really have any centralized leader like a king or a monarch. A monarch, And as we mentioned in the past, they were, in effect, self-governed. They were ruled by God, and they were punished by God. When they adhered to God's Torah, well, their enemies vanished, almost as if by divine edict. When they strayed from Torah, well, their enemies arose to persecute them, almost as a function of godly chastisement. The role of the judges was there to, to, to oversee, to nudge the people back, to fidelity to God, but they didn't have the strength of a monarch to compel or to enforce the law. And for 400 years, the system was nearly flawless. But there were two glaring exceptions. The two tragedies 
when the nation would have greatly benefited from a strong centralized authority of a king. The first was the Pesel Micha, the image of Micah. And the story goes, there was an old woman. She wanted to make a memorial to God. And it's not clear what she wanted this for, either to serve as an intermediary for God, alternatively as a means to prognosticate. They would use this image, this graven, molten image, as a means of clairvoyance. Regardless of what the reason was, she committed a grave sin because Torah is quite clear that making molten images is against Torah rules. Even if your intentions are noble and righteous, doesn't matter. But she was ignorant. She was naive, and she wanted to make a legacy image with with good intentions. So she takes 1,100 silver coins. She gives 200 of them to an artisan, and she says, okay, these other 900 silver coins, I want you to melt them and craft them and form them into an image. She does that, and then she takes her son Micah, and she appoints him as the steward, as the caretaker of this image. He installs it in his house, and he converts eventually his house into a house of idolatry. And even though he's not from the priestly family, he installs his son as the quote-unquote priest, and he makes a replica ephod, one of the garments of the high priest, and gives it to his son. And that's it. They start offering sacrifices to the idol. And this is a good example of sometimes the road to hell is paved with good intentions, it began as a memorial to God, but it spiraled and eventually became a shrine of idolatry. And scripture interjects the narrative by telling us in those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did as he pleased. There was a little bit of anarchy that allowed someone like Micah to do something as anathema as making a house of idolatry in their own home. Now, who exactly was this Micah character? So it's interesting. If you look at the sources, they give us a very intriguing, shall we say, backstory to Micah. Turns out, when you read about his backstory, that Micah had a long affinity for idols and graven images. The Midrash tells us that when the Jewish people were enslaved in Egypt, and they were forced, of course, to build the cities of Pithom and Ramses, And they had a certain quota, not the bricks that they had to build every day. Well, what happens if the quota was not met on a given day? So the Egyptians adopted a particularly cruel method of punishment. And they would say, okay, if you're missing a brick, we're going to supplant the brick with a baby. We'll take a Jewish baby and we'll cement them in to the place where the brick should have been. Uh, brutal, unimaginable cruelty. And when Moses is there, this is before the Exodus, obviously, he cries out to God. And he says that these poor, innocent babies, why do they have to die such a terrible death? So God responds to him, very interesting, very, I would say, philosophically difficult, you know, to absorb. God responds, says, well, these children are destined to be wicked. And therefore, it's better that they die righteous, they die pure, they die free of sin, for them to die as old sinners whose souls have become sullied. In fact, in one iteration, the Midrash compares, uh, it's like clearing out the weeds. You know, these are, these, these are things, these are people you don't want anyhow. That's what Moses is told. And of course, Moses says, how could I accept that? And he starts trying to save the babies. So he saves one baby. He pulls them out of the concrete. And this is Micah. This is baby Micah. And as we find out, it turned out to be a mistake. Uh, Sometime later, even before the period of the judges, Micah already displays a proclivity towards idols and images. How so? It's the Exodus. And the Jewish people are leaving Egypt. And Moses is busying himself with taking the bones of Joseph out of Egypt. And the Midrash tells us, how did he get the bones out? The bones were buried in the Nile. Moses didn't know exactly where they were. So he took a metal plate and he wrote on the metal plate, Ale Shar, arise, O ox. And he threw the metal plate into the water. And Joseph, of course, compared to an ox. And therefore, when the plate went into the water, the ox, meaning the bones of Joseph, floated to the top. He takes the bones of Joseph 
and he takes it with them on the journey leaving Egypt. Micah is watching this happen. And he senses an opportunity. He goes over and he grabs that metal plate upon which it was written, Arise, O Ox. A few months later, during the episode of the Golden Calf, what happens? Aaron is encouraged to make a golden calf. But what does Aaron know about making golden calves? He doesn't know anything about that. He tells the people, okay, give me your gold. And everyone pulls off their gold. And then Aaron takes all the gold and puts it in a huge fire. Comes along Micah and he pulls out that metal plate that says in it, arise, O ox. He throws that into the fire. And what comes out of that fire? A golden ox, little baby ox a golden calf. It's a long way of saying that this Micah character that we meet at the end of the book of Judges is A, someone that exists in the early part of the story of the era of Judges, but also he has a tendency for making idols and images, and now he has already made one in the land of Israel. So he's installed one in his house, and he's starting to offer sacrifices to this idol. The narrative continues with the arrival of a sidekick for Micah, a lad from the tribe of Judah who was also a Levite. This young boy, this lad, is wandering throughout the land and eventually he ends up in the house of Micah and he is going to become his apprentice and eventually his priest. Now it is interesting, Scripture describes him as being a Levite, which means he's from the tribe of Levi but also being from the tribe of Judah. You can only be from one tribe. What's the answer? The answer is, is that from his father's side, he was from the tribe of Levi. From his mother's side, he was from the tribe of Judah. But it becomes quite clear throughout the chapters that this is no ordinary Levite. He came from the most prestigious of families, He had the most of illustrious of pedigrees. He was actually the grandson of Moses. His father was Gershom. His grandfather was Moses. He was Jonathan. Micah sees he as a guest, a wandering Levite, someone from very illustrious stock, and he sees that now I have a chance to legitimize my little idolatrous temple And he says to this young Levi, he says, okay, I want to hire you. I want you to be my priest and you're going to work in my little temple. And he offers him a lucrative job. And this Levite, he accepts the offer and becomes a priest in Micah's idolatrous temple. Now, what's clear from the narrative is that he doesn't do this because of his desire, his conviction, idolatry. In fact, he dissuaded some people from entering the shrine and even cast aspersions on this form of worship, he just wanted the cushy job with the big salary. Nevertheless, the Talmud is puzzled by this. This is Moses' grandson. How does he end up in a place like this, participating in an idolatrous temple? The Talmud tells us in the book of Basra, page 109b, that it wasn't Moses that contributed to this, but Moses' father-in-law, Jethro. Jethro had offered sacrifices to idols, It's no shock, says the Talmud, that his great-grandson will offer sacrifices to idols too. And the Talmud advises us to cleave to good people, meaning to marry a woman from a good family, not just a good character, but from good stock as well. So we now have Micah and his homemade temple and this graven image, and now he has this Levite This individual, this Jonathan, as as he's called, he's working for him as his priest. The story continues with the arrival of the spies from the tribe of Dan. So like we mentioned, this is at the beginning of the era of Judges. And everyone's still trying to find their place in the land of Israel. And the tribe of Dan, they had a growing population and they had insufficient land. And therefore, they sent a contingency of five spies to go seek out more living space. And these people are traveling throughout the land to try to find a good place to conquer. So along the journey, they end up in the house of of Micah. 
and they spend the night there. And they meet and they befriend the young Levite who is serving as Micah's priest. And eventually the next day they travel and they find a perfect place, a land with eminently conquerable people, the inhabitants of the city of Laish. These people didn't really have any allies. They lived in unfortified cities. They were peaceful. They weren't combative. And they had no king, no prince to rally them together. They're a perfect target. If you want to conquer a people, this is the people that you want to conquer. So these five spies from the tribe of Dan, they convey the message back to their tribe. They assemble an army of 600 soldiers. Of 600 soldiers, We're going to conquer the city of Laish. Along the way, they stop off in the house of Micah. And they take his image. Oh, we kind of like this image. And they take all the paraphernalia of the temple and they pilfer it. And this Levite, this young priest, he starts protesting. And they say, no, 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 don't worry about it. You're coming with us too. We're going to offer you a job. You're working over here, this makeshift temple. It's, it's in someone's house. We're going to offer you a temple for an entire tribe, the entire tribe of Dan. To the Levite, this sounded like a promotion. And he joins the tribe of Dan. Meanwhile, they're traveling to conquer the city of Laish, and Micah comes home, and he finds his temple has been raided, his image that his mother commissioned has been taken, his priest is gone, and he starts pursuing the people who took his stuff. And he pursues after them, and he finds himself outnumbered and outgunned. And they say to him, okay, are you sure you want this? You want to fight? So Micah sees that the numbers are stacked against him and he slinks away and he goes home. So now this tribe of, uh, or this this group of warriors from the tribe of Dan, they arrive at the city of Laish, they attack it, they destroy it, they rebuild the city as their own, they rename the city Dan, and they set up the image of Micah as an idolatrous temple, they have that same Levite, that same grandson of Moses, Jonathan McGershom, but Moses, he's the priest. And this idolatrous temple was in existence for many generations, headed by that same Levite and his descendants. How did such a sacrilege continue for so many years? How was this idolatrous temple not suppressed? The answer is that this individual, this Levite, it gave it such legitimacy. It gave it prestige. And the only way to uproot it would have caused civil war. And the people said, we're not going to do civil war to fight with the tribe of Dan to stop this idolatry. And as a result of the failure to stop this horrific desecration of God's name, That was the cause for the final tragedy of the book of Judges, the story of the concubine of Giva, Pelegesh Begiva. And we read this story. It's one of the most horrific stories of our history. It begins innocuously enough with a domestic dispute, shall we say. It escalates with a shocking Sodom and Gomorrah-like murder. And it culminates with a brutal, catastrophic civil war that pits one tribe against the other 11. The story begins with another Levite, not related to the previous Levite, or at least not not in any way that we know, and he marries a concubine. But due to a domestic spat, she leaves him and she goes back to her father's home. The Talmud has a discussion, what was the argument about? Uh, Some say that he found a fly in his food. Others say that he wasn't happy with her grooming habits. Either way, he gets angry at her, And she abandons him. She goes back to her father's home. A few months later, the husband wants to reconcile and he wants to woo his wife back, his concubine back. So he travels back to his father's house and he comes to collect his wife. And he spends a couple of days there and he starts heading back. And they're heading back throughout the day, traveling back to his hometown. And they're stranded overnight in the Benjaminite town of Giva. And apparently, these people of Benjamin, or at least the people who lived in that neighborhood, 
were not very kind, were not very hospitable. And no one offers him a lodging to stay for the night. And there was one elderly man that lived in the region, wasn't from the tribe of Benjamin, but lived in the region, and he offered them a place to stay overnight. And what follows is eerily similar to the Sodom and Gomorrah narrative from Genesis. I want to read this to you. This is from chapter 19, verse 21 through 29. So the elder man takes them into his house. He prepares food for them. They bathe their feet. They eat and they drink. And they're enjoying themselves. And the men of the town, the depraved lot, they gather about the house. And they begin pounding on the door. And they call to the old owner of the house, bring out the man the Levite, who has come into your house so that we may be intimate with him. The people of this Benjaminite town had been exposed a little bit to the depraved ways of their Canaanite neighbors, and they were influenced by them, and this was a rotten bunch. And they demand their pound of flesh. Now, the owner of the house, he tries to mollify them. He says, please, my friends, do not commit such a disgusting thing. This man has entered my house. Don't perpetrate this outrage. But I have a virgin daughter. I have this man's concubine. I'll bring them out to you. Do to them what you wish, but don't touch the man. A very similar response to what Lot said to the mob in Sodom and Gomorrah in the book of Genesis. But the men, they're not listening And they're demanding the man. So the man just takes his concubine, he pushes her out, and they abused her the entire night until the morning. And they finally released her at dawn. And she has been violated, and she is absolutely destroyed. And she tries to make her way back to the house. She collapsed at the door of the house. And she dies. Husband wakes up in the morning. He opens the door and he sees his wife there. And he assumes that she's still alive. He says, okay, it's time to go home. And then he finds out that she's dead. What an outrage. So he takes her, puts her dead body now onto the donkey and brings her home. And when he gets home, he has a plan to stop these terrorists, these horrific ruffians of the tribe of Benjamin from behaving like this anymore. And he decides to make a stand. He takes her body, he takes a knife, and he cuts it into 12 different parts. And he ships a part of her body to the various tribes with an explanation of what happened. And the entire people get enraged. What a horrific atrocity, the likes of which our nation has never seen. And they quickly mobilize as one, the entire nation, to avenge this heinous crime and to kill the perpetrators of this deed, the people from the tribe of Benjamin from the city of Giva. So they reach out to the Benjaminites and they say to them, okay, hand over the guilty men and then we're good. Now the tribe of Benjamin, they weren't going to condone the crimes of the people of Giva. But they felt that the other tribes should mind their own business. This is an internal matter. We will intra-tribally resolve it. But the rest of the nation said, no, this is such a grievous crime. It's such an urgent matter of national importance. The whole nation needs to be partaking in the punishment of the guilty. And this is going to set the stage for a horrible and bloody civil war. The tribe of Benjamin had 26,700 soldiers, which included, according to scripture, 700 lefty sharpshooters who could, quote, sling a stone at a hair and not miss. These are, in effect, snipers. But the other side vastly outnumbered them. They had 400,000 sword-wielding soldiers. As the battle was being set, The rest of the Jews, they consulted the prophet, they consulted the high priest, they consulted the Urim Batumim to find out which tribe should attack first. And the tribe of Judah lit up on the high priest's breastplate, they're going to attack first. But they made a big mistake. They asked the wrong question. 
instead of asking which tribe should attack first, what they should have asked is, is this something to go to a civil war over? If that question was asked, then the answer would have been to try to resolve this conflict bloodlessly. But they made a mistake. They asked their own question. And as a result, the first skirmish ended poorly for the favorites. The outnumbered Benjaminites, they succeeded in killing 22,000 other Jews. The next day, another 18,000 were slaughtered. So the Jewish population have lost 10% of their army. An army of 400,000 has been reduced by 40,000. After being trounced twice, the other tribes, they had a spiritual reckoning. They cried. They fasted. They prayed. They offered sacrifices. And in the third battle, the tides turned drastically. The children of Israel lured the Benjaminites out of their cities, and they set up an ambush for them. The Benjaminites had initial success, and they thought, okay, day three, it's going to happen like the first two days. God's with us. They thought victory was imminent. But they outflanked them from behind, and they torched the vacant city of Giva. The Benjaminites, who seconds earlier were excited, they were they were confident, they were willing to leave their fortifications, they now were demoralized as they saw their city burning, and they began to flee. And the Israelites closed in on them, and they absolutely decimated them. Of the original army of 26,700 soldiers, 25,600 of them were eventually killed. The rest of them fled, and we don't really know where they are. In the ensuing rampage, civilians were not spared. Women and children were killed. Livestock was decimated. And all the Benjaminite cities were burned to the ground. The tribe of Benjamin was nearly entirely destroyed. There were no surviving women. And only 600 men survived this war. And really there were no winners both sides had tremendous casualties. And what's the result? This is a civil war. There never are any winners. There are just losers. Why did the nation suffer such a catastrophe? So the Midrash says something really interesting. It juxtaposes these two stories. The Midrash explains, you know, the people were so quick to condemn, so quick to express outrage over the fate of the human concubine who was treated so terribly and violently by the people of Benjamin, but for the image of Micah that stood for decades, that besmirched the honor of God, they were silent. And therefore, they were severely punished. The Midrash goes on to say that there's criticism to be levied at the Sanhedrin and at their leader, who at the time was Pinchas. The Sanhedrin, they were busy studying Torah. They were busy focusing on their own spiritual development. What they should have done They should have traveled from town to town and ensured the righteousness of the nation. Instead, they relied too much on the people's own conscience to govern themselves. The final chapter of the book of Judges picks up in the aftermath of this horrific national tragedy. Uh, The nation gathered in the city of Beth-El for essentially a post-war convention and reckoning. They prayed. They offered sacrifices, and there they realized that they actually have an existential problem, a national crisis that must be immediately addressed. After the tragedy of the concubine of Giva, this is before the conflict was resolved, before the conflict was over, before the civil war was concluded, a national oath was commissioned in the city of Mitzpah in which all the Israelites pledged to not allow their daughters to marry a Benjaminite. But now the war is over. And they realized that one of the 12 tribes is on the verge of extinction. There's only 600 men. There's no women. And we all committed an oath to not allow our daughters to marry a Benjaminite. So this tribe, one of the 12 tribes of Israel, they're going to go extinct. 
how do we solve the problem? How do we allow them to marry and at least continue and procreating and having that line of the nation continue? The problem was, well, they couldn't allow their oath to be transgressed. You can't just transgress your oath. You made an oath to not allow your daughter to marry them. No one, all of them agreed, the whole nation agreed, you can't allow anyone to marry them, but there's no women amongst the tribe of Benjamin. So they found an unusual solution to this crisis. When they initially had gathered in Mitzpah, there was one city, the city of Yavesh Gilad, that didn't join the national oath against intermarriage with Benjamin. In effect, this city was rebelling against the rest of the people. They were acting mutinously, treasonously, by not joining the rest of their brethren. Moreover, this city was a border town, and border towns are always on the vanguard. They're always facing off against the enemies. And the people on a border town, we cannot question their allegiances. They have to be resolutely unquestionable to the nation. And in addition, after the war, the entire nation gathered in Bethel to have a reckoning. But the city of Yavesh Gilad did not join the national post-war reckoning. Clearly, these people are not aligned with the interests of the entire nation. And therefore, the nation decided that this people that was tantamount to rebellion and the city must be destroyed. So another fighting force of 12,000 soldiers was assembled. They attacked and they killed all the males of the city and all its non-virgin females. And the only survivors were 400 virgin females. And they would say, okay, we got rid of one problem, this mutinous town, and we'll use the remnant, these women, to solve our other problem. We'll have them marry the Benjaminite men, and that way at least this tribe, tribe of Benjamin, will have continuity. And this is not going to be a transgression of the oath because, after all, this city didn't join the national oath. But the problem kind of remained because, after all, there were 600 surviving men and 400 surviving women. There is an imbalance. There's 200 men that are not accounted for. And a, another solution was reached for this dilemma, an annual bridal festival in the city of Shiloh. The women of Shiloh were dressed in white and they would dance in the fields, and the men of Benjamin would watch from the surrounding vineyards, and then they would seek one that was suitable to marry, and they would take her. And the rationale was, because the actual technical nature of the oath was that no man will give his daughter to a Benjaminite man. But if a Benjaminite man takes one of their daughters, that's not a violation of the oath. Now, of course, this would be done with the woman's agreement. It's prohibitive for her to marry a woman against her will, obviously. But essentially what they did is they changed the dating scene. They restructured it in a way that the men took the women and they weren't given to them by their families and thereby they sidestepped the oath. That's the final chapter of the book of Judges. And the book of Judges concludes, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his eyes. The insinuation is that had there been a strong king, this senseless war with more than 70,000 casualties could have been avoided. But I think it's important to stress in conclusion uh, of the book of Judges, it's important to not misrepresent the era. This was a time of self-government. There was no king but the Jewish people governed themselves. There's many, many instances where the nation gets together to pray, to fast, to offer sacrifices. They weren't compelled to do that. They did it on their own, their own volition. They had the internal motivation, the internal conscience to motivate them to do the right thing in their eyes. There's many instances in the book of Judges, for example, where armies were mobilized. Well, how do you mobilize the army? So you have a draft. You can't just get people to volunteer to die. Yet there's no king. There's no draft. Everyone's volunteering. There's another way to read this final verse of the book of Judges. And that is, 
there was no king of Israel, but they didn't need a king in Israel because everyone did what was right, what was truly right in their eyes. They didn't need to have someone else tell them what was right. They knew it internally. Yes, there were some periods of sin. Yes, there were two glaring national blunders. But during the era of the judges, it was, for the most part, a time of tremendous righteousness, righteousness that will not be matched by any subsequent generation. Before we go, I want to remind everyone, tomorrow is our big fundraiser. At the time that you are listening to this podcast, our fundraiser is live. Go to givetorch.com. I'm going to put the link in the description of the podcast. This year, like we mentioned, it's the first year that we're doing a special team to recognize the listeners of the Jewish History Podcast. So show your support. Every donation is quadrupled. Help keep the flame of Torah, the beacon of Torch, lit for another amazing year. Thank you so much for your support. I look forward to hearing from you, RabbiWalby at gmail.com.